This episode of the Duke Basketball Report podcast is brought to you by the fine gentlemen of Bird Campbell. If you have legal needs in the states of Florida or Texas, we urge you, please reach out to the two Dukies at Bird Campbell. Bird Campbell means business. Duke fans, welcome to episode 127. We got 126 of these in the books, about to have 127 of them down and dirty of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. I am just rambling and don't even know what I'm saying, but I'm your host this week. I am Jason Evans, as always, and I am joined by my two partners in crime in Durham, North Carolina, Sam Klein. Uh, Jason, Duke is hosting, yes. <laughs> Duke is hosting a football game this weekend featuring a team that is ranked lower than Duke in the football polls. I mean, like, what? <laughs> hey, that's going to happen more and more, I think. Um, and uh, 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 Sam, uh, thanks for pointing that out. We will get to that in a minute. But first, I want to bring in our other partner for the evening, Donald Wine in Washington, D.C. Donald, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. It's It's kind of rainy. It's been raining the last two days here, but... I am anxious to get down to Durham this weekend. I'm not going to the game because I am there for a wedding, but best believe I will be in a black tie tuxedo with my Duke cufflinks. Oh, that sounds nice. That sounds very nice. Before we get to football, folks, we are the Duke Basketball Report podcast. And every so often, even during the football season, we got to bring you some basketball news. We had some really cool stuff this past week. We were very lucky. I, I've been, I want you all to know, I've been beating the phones. I've been beating the email. I've been trying hard to get the key interviews that all of you want to hear, to let you hear from the really cool, really interesting former Dukies that are out there in the world. Um, be, because we love to get their insight on what it's like to be at Duke and what it was like to be a basketball player in there and what they're doing now that they've moved beyond. And I got a good one this past week. Uh, folks, get ready. Here is my interview with none other than Grayson Allen. Hey, Grayson. Hey. Hey, how are you, sir? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Not bad. Thanks so much for joining us. Your voice is so familiar to me because I've seen so many interviews with you. <laughs> well, thanks for having me on. Yes, the the Duke basketball report is thrilled that you could join us, Grayson Allen. I, I want to. I, I know we only have a limited amount of time. I want to start. This may seem like a really obvious question, but all four years of your career, there was talk that you would go to the NBA draft, even even after your freshman year. Talk about your decision to come back to school each year and and what went into it, and and uh, I, no regrets, I'm sure, right? Yeah, no, no regrets at all. Uh, each year was a, there was a little bit different thought process. Um, after my, I mean, after my freshman year, I never honestly considered going to the league just because I had like a couple good games at the end of the year, and that was about it. Um, but ultimately, what it came down to is when, when I was like dreaming of coming to Duke, I was, I, I obviously wanted to play in the NBA, but I wanted to play at Duke, and I knew that for four years, that's where I was going to have the most fun playing. I was going to enjoy my time there. I mean, I had dreamed of playing in front of Cameron, so I couldn't pass up more years of playing in Cameron and playing for coach. And and every year there, I felt like I was learning and becoming a better basketball player, too. So I felt like, you know, the NBA game is obviously different, but it wasn't, like, hindering my developing development by staying because I was having a great chance to be coached by a great coach and great assistant coaches and then play with extremely talented guys. So um, it all worked. And – you know, getting my degree at the end of the day was a, a huge accomplishment, something I'm very proud of. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, absolutely. Congratulations about that. You, you mentioned playing with different teammates. Um, uh, you know, what was it like to have so many different guys every single year? I mean, you came in with three guys who were all one and done, um, and then you had new sort of one and done running mates who were your, you know, primary other, the other primary players on the team every year. Uh, was that especially difficult? Uh, it, it was a little difficult, but it, and mainly because, you know, you, you build something with a team each year. So, for example, for a freshman year, you have 
three of the main guys on that team are Justice, Tyus, and Ja. And then the next year, you know, you built chemistry. Those guys got some experience. And then the next year you have a new group of guys coming in. And then it's the same thing junior year. So really, you know, it's April comes and the season's over. And then that first first workout of the summer or whatever in July, you're, you're starting over and you have to kind of start fresh and, and regroup and, you know, get the team to gel quickly for the next year. And um, so it is difficult from that standpoint, but it uh, makes it a little bit easier when, you know, it's Brandon Ingram coming in or Jason Tatum, you know, <laughs> makes it <laughs> yeah, yeah. a little bit smoother of a transition. Uh, hey, so I have to ask, and feel free to say I can't answer that, but I mean, <laughs> Brandon Ingram, uh, you know, the guys you played with last year, um, your freshman year teammates, uh, Jason Tatum. Who's the best Duke teammate that you had? Who is the one player who you're like, that guy's just a freak? The best one? Um, I had to I had to go with Ja because Ja was, out of all the guys that I played with, the most dominant, like by far the most dominant. I mean, we knew worst comes to worst in your offense. We threw it down the Jaw, and – he was either going to get – I mean, he had a double team or a triple team all year and shot like 65%. And he was a great passer out of the post too. So, you know, he could get the other guy's shots by, you know, palming the ball and throwing it like a baseball across the court. Um, so I think him, just from a, like a dominant standpoint, and then obviously it's the talent separation isn't that much from all the guys that play because they're all so good. But, I mean, from day one when Jock came in, he was extremely dominant. Hey, can I talk with you really quickly about freshman year? Um, you know, I'm sure you're wearing a big ring today because of it. You were so patient that year. I mean, you didn't get a lot of playing time early on. Um, and, and then, you know, sort of later in the season, it started to happen for you. And then suddenly you explode <laughs> on the biggest stage in the final four. Uh, you know, talk to me a little bit about what the emotions of all of that was like. And, and did, did you realize, <laughs> oh, my God, I'm doing this on the biggest stage in my sport? <laughs> I did. I honestly didn't realize it at the time. And um, I know I'm, I know I might have seemed patient the whole year, but there was definitely like you're getting frustrated with yourself because you're probably I'm not playing well in practice when I get in the games, I'm not playing well. So a lot of it was just kind of mental and getting in the right mindset to get out there and just play and not worry about it. But, I mean, in, in the big game like that, I honestly don't even remember, like, many individual plays from that game. Um, Do you go back and I watch it? Com- yeah, I went back and watched it. Um, I watched, like, highlights of it the night of, obviously, and then, you know, a little bit later in that summer, I watched the game once or twice, but. I like first-hand memory of it. It's that's not there. I was just so like in the moment and not thinking about how big of a moment it was. Just going out there and playing. Uh, so I I go from the the big moment of your freshman year to um to the disappointment at the the end of your senior year, the final game against Kansas. Do do you see that shot like just rolling off the rim in your sleep? Because I certainly do. <laughs> I did for a little bit, for sure. I think, you know, if the if they had turned the screws on the rim one one rotation looser, I think it would have gone in. <laughs> but uh, no, it was a it was a you know I went back and watched the game too, just you know just to see and study it and you know see what could have could have done what I could have done better stuff like that. And it was obviously to come down to you know a shot like that, but. You know, we had a chance in overtime, too, and Kansas was really good that year, so I can't I can't beat myself up too much for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, hey, let me move really quickly to your NBA career. Uh, first of all, let me ask, hey, Quinn Snyder, did, did you know him at all um, from your time at Duke? Um, you know, how great is it to be going to the NBA with a guy who's part of the brotherhood? And I hadn't talked to him that much before I was drafted. Um but, you know, I've obviously talked to him a lot now. We've had some conversations, you know, about playing for coach, playing at Duke, things like that. And I think it's awesome to have a uh, – to have a – you know, I'm leaving Duke and going to a place where there's an, a coach 
from Duke. So I think it's it's really cool to have that connection and kind of carry that with me. And I think he knows, you know, with me staying at Duke for four years, a lot of the stuff that I went through, you know, what it was like playing for coach. He probably knows my personality and some of the habits that I'm bringing from playing for coach for four years because he probably had the same thing. So I think it's really cool. So you played really well um, in the summer league. Uh, that had to be encouraging. Talk to me a little bit about what kind of a role, what, what kind of things do you think you bring to the floor uh, in the NBA, and, and what, do you, what do you think you need to work on the most? Uh, well, I think going, you know, going back to me playing with different guys every year at Duke, I think it, it rounded my game out. And, you know, where I might have came in as just a scorer, I learned how to pass the ball really well. Um, you know, learned how to handle the ball, learned how to play off ball, learned how to, you know, move and relocate, get to spots, learned how to use different actions like pin down, triple handoffs, and things like that. So it it put me in a position where I can do a lot of things on the offensive end besides just, you know, scoring the ball in a one-on-one situation. And I think that really helps coming into the league and coming in a team like Utah who moves the ball. Um as far as, you know, the NBA game goes, I think getting consistent with the deeper shot, you know, that couple feet doesn't sound like a lot, but, you know, when you're shooting thousands of them, you want to get you want to get used to it. Um, and then contributing on the defensive end because, you know, as a rookie, I think that's a, a rookie on a playoff team, a talented team, that's when it's going to, you know, get me minutes on the floor is, you know, making plays on the defensive end and, um, you know, hitting open shots and making good plays on the offensive end. and so that's that's kind of my mindset of where I'm starting at, and then building from there. So, so only two more questions, Grayson. The the, the first one is, and I, I hearken back to the very first thing I asked you about, um, you know, about staying at Duke for four years. Um, uh, you know, so many of the guys you're around now, so many of the guys in the NBA left college early, um, uh, and and the three guys you came in with left college early, and they've had you know, varying degrees of success uh, as a result. What advice What advice would you give, you know, guys who are playing big-time college basketball about whether they should stay or, or, or whether they should go? Um, I, you're, you're, you're just so unusual in, in that regard. I think at the end of the day, you like, it's very hard for, you know, people who are considering go to the draft or not because you're going to have a lot of, you're going to have a lot of voices and a lot of opinions coming at you. So what I tried to do for each decision was find my voice and what I was feeling, what I wanted to do. And I I think I was able to do that. And my voice kept telling me to can't do, don't go anywhere. So I think that's the biggest thing is you have a lot of people telling you, you should do this, you should do that. Obviously get your information in ways both options but at the end of the day listen listen to your heart listen to what you're feeling and I hope that I'm an example where you know guys don't feel like they have to leave early or else you know they're going to mess up stock or whatever Um, I think there are advantages to staying and coming out a well-rounded player like I did with more experience and um, you know sure you might miss one two three years of getting paid in the NBA but you know it can help out your career in the long time and uh, in the long run, and uh, I had a lot of fun doing what I'm doing, so I have no regrets about it. And and, and I have to tell you, on behalf of all Duke fans, we are thankful, <laughs> and we're glad that you <laughs> stuck around. Um, so last question, and I'll, I'll I'll tell you right off the bat that we ask this of every single former Dukey that we that we interview, and uh, you're like the you know we've interviewed like a dozen of you guys now. I always ask everyone for a good Coach K story. I want something that reveals something about the man. <laughs> and I've gotten some great ones in the past, so pressure's on. I want your best. Oh, you were there for four years. You should have you should have tons of great Coach K stories. Give me give me a really good one. Oh man. Um I know you're trying to figure out one that you can tell safely, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you know, this isn't, uh, this probably isn't as good of a story as other people have have told, but the biggest thing that I've, like, taken from Coach in my four years there, you know, he's, I, I wish that I could, I had, like, a tape recorder in all of our meetings, because in every meeting, it's like, he says so many good things that you're like, how am I going to remember all this for my life, but 
And uh, in one of our meetings, you know, he was talking about how you how you carry yourself, not only in practice, pre-practice, post-practice, but you know, off the court and going to class, doing whatever and everything you're doing. And he he basically told us to you approach everything, you treat everything like it's important because you're doing it. So everything is important because you're doing it. So you know, it doesn't matter if you're doing something you don't like it's important because it's your time and you're doing it and that that really stuck with me and I try to I try to you know everything I'm doing it might be something I don't like you know um, I wish I would have been told that as a little kid when I was doing chores around the house or mowing the lawn I might have approached it a little better but you know even nowadays you know everything that I do it might be something I don't want to I, I I do it the best I can and I treat it like it's very important because of that and because I'm doing it and and that, that just speaks to coach because coach does everything that he does as a high, at a high level, at the highest level he can. And I think he lives out every moment like that. Well, that, that, that is great advice for all of us. And, um, and I know Coach Case had such a huge positive impact on you. Grayson, thanks so much for joining us here on the Duke Basketball Report podcast. Great to talk with you, and we wish you so much luck. You don't need luck, but we'll wish it to you anyway uh, with your career in the NBA and, and, and your time in Utah. We're going to be watching it closely, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Guys, I, I want to thank Grayson again for joining us on the DBR podcast. I had a great time chatting with him um, uh, at the Utah Jazz. I want to thank the Utah Jazz PR department. I hammered them for a while. At, at first, I was hammering them. I was like, Quinn Snyder, Quinn Snyder, I need to talk to Quinn Snyder. And they kept on saying, no, no, no. And then I said, how about Grayson Allen? And they said, ooh, we can get you Grayson. But uh, I thought Grayson's interview was was really wonderful. Um, I, I, I especially loved him. I really liked him talking a little bit about, you know, sort of, the, the strange path he had, you know, playing with all these one and done guys over the years. But, but guys, I want to hear your reaction. Um, Sam, tell me what, what did, what did you like? What did, what did you take away from what Grayson had to say? I enjoyed the question about which of his teammates from his time at Duke. And he played with so many really talented guys who are now all over the NBA, but which of them he thought was like the most dominant or the best one. And that the answer was Jolly Loca for, because, I look back on Grayson's time at Duke and I might say it was Jason Tatum. It was Brandon Ingram, the guys maybe who have had more NBA success, but, Mar- uh, but, but we have Marvin Bagley. I mean, like, or even Marvin Bagley. Marvin Bagley do things. No freshman, yeah. No freshman's ever done some of the things Marvin Bagley did. And, and that would be fresh in his mind. But yeah, I agree. I love the jaw answer. Go, go continue. Well, I, I, I was just going to say that I think that, that jaws NBA career so far has been, fairly disappointing given given where he was drafted and the expectations he had coming out of high school and then given what a strong year he had finishing second in the national player of the year voting in 2015 i think we all thought jolly Okafor is going to be a, a pretty good nba player maybe he's not going to be a superstar because just there aren't that many guys who become superstars but we thought he had he had a pretty good career ahead of him and and so far out of his class he's he's been the least successful of that of that cohort and i was uh, so so anytime we we talk about all these one and done guys i think jolly loca for kind of takes you know is, is sort of in that second or third tier behind the guys who've had the most success like Kyrie, like tatum like i think we expect bagley to have perhaps wendell carter in this class but to not forget just how how nuts Jolly Okafor was for his one year in college. He was so good pretty much that whole year. I mean, he was hurt for a little bit of it, but Grayson reminds us that that no one was was doing stuff that that Jolly Okafor was doing that year. And maybe Grayson just has something of an affinity for him because they were in the same recruiting year and they they were in the dorms together and and all that stuff. But uh, that was an interesting answer from him. You, you know what I loved about that answer that I thought was really interesting was <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> as I clear my throat. So Grayson said the cool thing about Jalil Okafor was they would, you know, if the shot clock was running down, if they just needed a basket, if they didn't know what to do on offense, they would dump it into him and Ja would either score or make a great pass, you know, but essentially he was their rock. He was their go-to guy when they needed a bucket. And the interesting thing to me is that for the next three years, 
that was Grayson Allen. So Grayson knows what that pressure is like. I mean, look, remember that his sophomore year when it was him and Brandon Ingram and like Marshall Plumley. I mean, like the, that that team, that's one of the least talented Duke teams in a long time. And he really he was the the rock. He was the guy they relied on. Grayson Allen was. And for Grayson to recognize, uh, you know, the burden that he carried and how it was so much easier when when Ja was carrying that burden, I thought was a really interesting answer. I, I, I love that part of it. Donald, what about you? What's your reaction to the Grayson interview? You know, I, I really liked uh, I, I liked the jaw answer. Uh, the other thing that I really liked is when he was talking about uh, just the fact that he he loved Duke so much that he kept coming back. Um, and, and you could tell in his voice whenever we asked him a question about about Duke, he just kind of you could you, I kind of could feel him smile as he was as he was answering the question because you could tell he has a you, you know a special bond uh, to Durham as we all do, and and I think. Is you know sometimes, and I'm not saying that other players don't exude that same you know affinity for uh, the Gothic Wonderland, but you could tell every time he answered a question and he got to say the words Duke, uh, you know, or Duke basketball or, or or Durham, like he, you could tell he loved the place, and and I and I think it's great that in the end, you know, in a, in a era where it's a lot of one and dones, he's played with a ton of them. Um, the simple fact that he just loved Duke so much that he kept coming back and that he wanted to get better and he, you know, wanted to play under coach K those things are all, all very heartwarming to hear. And, and it's, it's not something you hear very often. So it's cool to hear him say that. Yeah. Oh, I totally agree. And, and I, once again, I want to thank Grace Allen, thank the Utah jazz for, for uh, bringing him, letting him come on our show. A, a lot of great insight from him and, and folks be on the lookout. I, I think, Maybe my hard work will pay off again. I think we have some other cool interviews coming up um, in the in the very near future. Don't, Jason, don't spoil any of it. Just just let the people keep tuning in. They they understand all the hard work you're doing, and they know that the good stuff is coming again soon. There, there's there's one of them that's going to happen. It's going to happen really soon. And when it happens, I'm going to tell you all how long, how many emails I have sent trying to get this one interview. Um, but I'm not going to give it away yet. So Grayson Allen is a recent graduate of Duke. And if you are someone who's about to graduate from Duke, you should let Duke alum Brett Etheridge and Dominate Test Prep provide you with all the skills you need to go on to the next level. Dominate Test Prep is one of our sponsors here on the DBR podcast. They provide online courses for the GMAT and the GRE. They are flexible. They are affordable. And most importantly, they teach Brett's proven test-taking strategies that produce high scores on test day. If you or someone you know is looking to get into a top school, let a guy who bleeds Duke blue help you out. You can learn more at dominatetestprep.com. That's dominatetestprep.com. And hey, make sure you use the coupon code GODEVILS to save 10% off your course package. And again, we want to thank Brett Etheridge for being a sponsor of the DBR podcast. All right, guys, we're done with the basketball. It is time to turn to football because it is that time of year and because the Duke Blue Devils are now 4-0. and They are ranked in the polls, number 22 in the uh, uh, in one poll and 23 in the other, I think it is. I, I should really know this off the top of my head. But in any event, Duke is ranked. That doesn't happen all the time, and we are thrilled to have it happen because we defeated North Carolina Central 55-13. to was a game that was maybe a little closer than people wanted, you know, for a little while. But uh, but then the Blue Devils absolutely blew them out. Now, gentlemen, as you recall, we, we kind of knew that Duke was going to win this game. Um, they were like a 40-point favorite. Um, and NC Central, you know, great program. I, I wish them all the luck in the world. But they just don't have the athletes to contend with Duke. So, so guys, I, I, you know, what our task for this game, each one of us had one thing we wanted Duke to work on. One thing we wanted to see from the Devils. Donald, I'm going to go to you first. Tell us what you wanted to see in the NC Central game, and then did it happen? I The uh, the thing that I asked uh, them to work on was to work on the edges uh, and the, on the rush defense and kind of hold guys uh, and contain those edges so that they don't go for big yards. And for the most part, 
they did that. Um, you know, 136 yards rushing is all they gave up, which isn't that much, you know, especially on 34 carries. That's, you know, NC Central was trying to run the ball and establish run, and we weren't letting them do that. And I think especially that's well, and and Donald in, in a game, in a game where Duke was ahead comfortably basically the whole day, and Central was getting up. Op- it's not like there weren't possessions for right for them they were they had ball. tons. I mean, we scored a lot of points, and they had plenty of opportunities to run throw. Uh, and I thought the defense did pretty well uh, on the day. Yes, like you said, there was a couple of a. Uh, a couple of moments where we were like, hey, what's going on over here? Maybe we should get it back together. But the team did. And, and I think that is something good to see. Um, obviously, there's there were some things that you want to improve. You, you want to if you have a team like NC Central and you have a chance to take them out early, you should do it. Um, and you want to have that killer instinct. That's something that hopefully uh, they can, you know, look at the game tape, see what they did wrong and get it correct for Virginia Tech. Hey, hey did you see the defensive stat for the second half? Because. Um, Duke Duke shut NC Central out in the second half, and 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 in fairness, even though like at one point the score was twenty to thirteen, and you were like, oh wait, this is closer than I thought. I mean, it's worth noting that it was twenty to thirteen because we basically completely blew a fourth and one and gave them a touchdown as a result. I mean, they NC Central did not do much of anything against our defense. Get this in the second half. Are you ready for this? NC Central gained. Actually, let me add. Did, do you guys know the answer to this? Uh, Donald will ask you, do you know how many yards NC Central gained in the second half of the game? I do not. Eight. But you're going to tell me. Eight? Eight. Eight like, yards. Like one more than seven? Entire... It's, not, <laughs> it's not very many. No, it's not many at all. No, they had one first down. They, they went backwards sometimes. So they had one first down in the entire second half. They gained eight yards in the entire second half. I Look, mean, Oh I don't God. I don't care I don't care what team is on the other side of the football if you if if that is the stat that is absolutely astounding and and terrific. I don't care who again, I don't care who you're playing. If you're playing a high school team and you're, you know, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers or whoever, you give up 8 yards in a in a half, that's it. Like that's incredible. So, hats off to the Duke defense for really just locking down and saying, "Hey, we will not let them advance the football at all." That's good. Um, yeah, so there's a great defensive stat. Before I get to, to Sam for his thing, there's a great defensive stat I wanted to bring up um, uh, that, that was tweeted about by Sports Source Analytics that said um, 86% of opponents' drives against Duke in 2018, 86% of the time, the opponents do not score a point. And that is the highest percentage of shutout drives of any team this year in all of college football. I mean, the Duke defense using that metric is the best defense in the country, which I think is a really fascinating and cool stat. And our D has been amazing. All right, Sam, your turn. What were you looking for against NC Central and did it happen? So the thing I said I was looking for was for Duke not to have the starters play too many minutes. And to some extent, I think that they tried to limit the the number of plays that that the first teamers were getting, but especially on offense, what with having Quentin Harris in there and and having a number of other injuries, I think that that it was important in this game really to see the first teamers get a few more reps than we would have liked against Central, especially heading into the Virginia Tech game. So not quite what what I wanted to see, but it was nice that that you know there are there are more repetitions coming for for Harris, who is still the starting quarterback. It does sound like there's some rumblings about Daniel Jones possibly coming back this week. I am not a doctor. I don't understand how someone recovers from a broken collarbone in three weeks. I don't know how that works. But um, but unless, you know, if Jones can't go, then we're going to need we're going to need Harris in there if we're going to to beat Virginia, if Duke is going to beat Virginia Tech. I I did want to make an admission and also tell you guys a story here and I think it's the time to do it. So I'll I'll start by admitting that I didn't get to see this game because I was at a wedding on Saturday out uh, a few hours away from Durham. It was out in rural Virginia. One of my uh, very best friends from childhood was getting married. And Wait, you didn't see the game? You didn't see didn't, the game? You're I didn't see the game. No, no, no. You're fired. Well, all right. Get out of here. Sorry. Sorry <laughs> folks. You're going to like it's okay, you're going to like I didn't see most of it either. You're going to like this story. I saw it later. You're going to like this story. You're going to like this story 
I Go guarantee ahead. it. Yeah. You're going to like this story. I guarantee it. Uh, the, so I, I, I was at this wedding and um, I said it was, it was a few hours away from, from where I am here in Durham. So I drove up there. Uh, it's about two hours before the wedding's going to start. And I get out of my car at the hotel where I'm going to go check in and, and change. And I realized in that moment that I had left my suit back in my apartment. That was, <laughs> I now, saw the story this was now funny. approximately, it was approximately four hours away from where I was. The wedding was starting in two hours. I was in a t-shirt and shorts and I had, I had a mild panic attack. I, I can't, I can't say that I was. This was the highest moment of my, the best moment of my life. Sam, this is so, this is what the men's warehouse was made for, right? So oh, did, no, did, no, you, no. did you did you note? Oh no! Did you note? Did you note when I introed the story? I said, uh, "You're gonna like you're gonna like this story." I guarantee it. I was trying to I was trying to use that the men's warehouse marketing campaign. Anyway, uh, but I didn't go to a men's warehouse because I was not near one. What I was near was a Goodwill. Uh, a, a th- oh, this is good. <laughs> I was near a thrift store, so I I rolled in. I only had two hours, and I really did not feel like I didn't feel like going to. I think I also had like a TJ Maxx as an option, but I'm sort of a I'm sort of a strange shaped person. I, it's it's hard for me to buy clothes off the rack, so I didn't really want to spend like like cheap fancy clothes money on on clothes that weren't going to fit anyway. I thought if I'm gonna buy clothes that don't fit anyway. I, I might as well just really go for it and and not spend almost anything at all. So I went to the Goodwill. I found a pair of khakis that were eh, maybe like an inch and a half too wide around the waist and probably about eh, three inches too long and a little baggy. <laughs> I found a I found a blue blazer um, that fit my shoulders but was kind of long. Uh, I'm 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 a shorter sort of dude. And then I I found a button down shirt, uh, like a white button down shirt that uh that was fine actually except that it was french cuff and i obviously didn't have cufflinks you didn't so, have cufflinks yeah right. yeah so i just i just rolled those those sleeves up and wore the jacket <laughs> over it and was like whatever man i'm gonna deal with it so instead of being at the the walloping of north carolina central by duke i was a few hours away wearing clothes meant for somebody who weighs about 50 pounds more than i do and really just enjoying myself um, to the best of my abilities. So I'm sorry that I couldn't be there, but I got a great story and a good Instagram post out of it. And I will absolutely be at the game this weekend against Virginia Tech. Don't you worry about that. But wait, but wait, you forgot the, the, you forgot the main part of the story. How much did the outfit cost? Oh, uh, $16. <laughs> oh, nice. He did all that, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, for sixteen dollars. God bless America. Yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, the listen, the the people wanted a good story, and and that's what they got. Also, I had to while I was at the at the wedding, like I I didn't look good. Let's let's be totally clear here. None of these clothes <laughs> fit me exactly right. I looked I looked ridiculous. So every single person that I saw that I walked up to it was like, "Hey, how you doing?" By the way, before you. Before you think anything, I bought these clothes an hour ago for sixteen dollars. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't want you thinking, I don't want you thinking that just because I'm I'm a graduate student again means that I can't afford clothes. Um, I just really am just not on top of my game today. Um, the the I think the hurricane just just threw me off pretty bad. So anyway, looking forward to Virginia Tech. Do we have anything more to talk about NC Central? Jason, do you have do you have NC Central thoughts that that you need to that you need to share with the people? Well, I, I just wanted to very, uh, by the way, great story. That's, that's a ton of fun. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. I, I do want to briefly talk. The, the one thing I said I was looking for, as you may recall, was I wanted to see better accuracy from Quentin Harris or whoever it was that was playing quarterback for Duke um, because uh, I, I knew we were going to win this game anyway. I knew we could run all over NC Central, that we were just too big. By the way, there was a great play. Sam, I know you didn't see the game, so you should go and watch it. In the second quarter, <laughs> there's, there's a, a great – play where um Britton brown runs for about seven or eight yards um and there's kind of a pile up it's one of those situations where he's still standing and the defense can't bring him down and and our offensive line starts pushing you know and and sometimes those go for an extra three or four yards Th- this time it went for like an extra 10 to 15 yards <laughs> it was this pile of 22 guys it was a rugby scrum and and the duke 
offensive line got an extra 15 yards out of it. I mean, that play was a demonstration of how Duke was able to just run all over these guys if we wanted to, because we're just bigger than they are. That's just reality. But I was looking for uh, our QB play and, and especially for Quentin Harris to, to be more accurate. He was more accurate than he was against, um, Baylor, but not a lot more accurate. 15 of 27. Um, I still thought he missed a, a, a lot of throws that he really could have made. He, he again, he didn't have any interceptions. He did have a really bad um, fumble on that fourth down play. It looked like there was a mix up or something between him and the center. Um, uh, you know, so he turned the ball over once, but no interceptions, which is good. Um, but but uh, boy, yeah, D- Duke's going to need more out of Quentin Harris, I think, to uh, to to win our upcoming games and. You know, I think that's sort of the perfect segue. I think it's time for us to preview Virginia Tech. So as we mentioned, the Devils have uh, the Blue Devils have a huge game coming up this weekend um, uh, in Durham. uh, Seven o'clock primetime game on ESPN two against Virginia Tech against the Hokies and uh, this is a game that uh, we predicted a, a, you know, a week ago. I was the one who said it. I said both Duke and Virginia Tech will be ranked coming into this game. It'll be a ranked matchup between two ranked teams. And I was wrong, but not wrong because of Duke. I was wrong because somehow, and I mean, like, this might be, this is arguably the biggest upset in all of Power 5 college football this year. Virginia Tech, who was ranked in like the high teens. I think they were as high as like number 12. Virginia Tech lost to Old Dominion. Virginia Tech lost to Old Dominion this week. Now, Old Dominion has been a football program only since 2009. There, I have underwear that is older than the, Virgin, than the uh, Old Dominion football team. Hey, TMI. <laughs> and, <laughs> and let's talk a little bit about what Old Dominion was like before they played Virginia Tech. Well, their opening week, they played Liberty, the powerhouse Liberty Flames. I think they're the Flames. I don't even know what they're called. Liberty, whatever they are. Liberty beat them by 42 points. I think Liberty is the Flames, uh, Jason. That's that's a good pull. Hey, thank you. I can can know my stuff sometimes. They played Florida International, who I think are the Panthers. They are. Oh, oh, how about that? I, I'm two for two. They played Florida International, another powerhouse. They lost by eight. And then Old Dominion played UNC Charlotte, the 49ers, and they lost that game by three. But, I mean, they were 0-3 against three bad teams. Old Dominion is like the was thought to be like the third or fourth worst team in all of, you know, major college football. Um, and they beat Virginia Tech. I don't even know how this happened. In Yo, the they process, popped them. Like, let's let's they get killed them. Get yeah, it. They popped them. it was forty nine thirty five. They they put almost fifty points up on them and popped them in the process. And and Old Dominion was playing with their backup quarterback, and Virginia Tech lost their starting quarterback, and he's going to be out for a while. He like broke his leg or ACL. I don't even know what it is. Josh broke Jackson, go- Josh Jack- gone. Forget about Josh Jackson. Don't worry about Josh Jackson anymore. All right, Donald, you're you're in on this. Talk to me a little bit more. Um, about Virginia Tech and this big match that Duke has coming up. A lot of people thought this was going to be the match for the the for our division in the ACC, and and it turns out instead, the Coastal Division maybe Virginia Tech isn't going to be the favorite in the Coastal Division. Well, I mean, it, let's be real. It's still it's still an important game in the Coastal Division because uh, you know it's going to be you know Virginia Tech has one conference win. This will be our first conference matchup, so you want to get out ahead of them. Like if Virginia Tech is supposed to be the class of the division, then you want to get ahead of that and get that one win. Uh, you know, Miami is also also in, in the mix as well. Um, so we we can't look past Virginia Tech. We can't say this is going to be easy matchup because they lost Josh Jackson. One person on defense that they lost is uh, Trevon Hill, who they dismissed for, I guess it was a uh, uh, conjunct detrimental to the team, but he is off the football team. He was their leading defensive star. He led them in sacks and I believe uh, was one of the leaders in tackles. Uh, so far this year. So that's a big loss for them on that side of the football. So what what do we got to do to win, right? Like it's it's, it's Saturday night. It's prime time. We're 4-0. We're ranked. We're playing a team that is ranked in one poll and another they dropped out because of this, you know, loss right before. But you want to come out early and establish momentum early. You want to get the crowd behind you. You want to get the momentum behind you. And 
for Virginia Tech, you can't let them into this football game because they're obviously going to want to respond. This is is almost uh, to say this was a bad loss, not just for them but for us, because you don't want you don't want to see a pissed off team entering your house on in primetime football. And Virginia Tech plays well in, under the light, so you want to get out ahead of them, get that momentum. And on offense, we have to score. You know, we don't, we shouldn't be, you know, I'm not saying we have to score every single time we get the football. Donald, Donald, But that's Donald. what we should. Yeah. Donald. Yeah. Can you do better than we have to score? I was I trying mean, to. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to. But no, right. really, the, the issue is when you play a team, like for us, for Duke, this is a statement game. This is to show that we are as good, if not better, than the 20 second ranking that we have and you know how it is when when as virginia tech is 23 people like oh yeah well they beat this team they they whoop this team by 30 whatever they deserve being top 25 but when they say when you see duke number 22 people are like how do they earn that how did they earn that ranking how do they deserve to be number 22 they have to make a statement with this game to do that you have to score when you get your opportunities and and that is not something where we don't want to have a game where it's 10 seven in the fourth quarter. I, I think we, I, I'm confident we could win with our defense. Our defense is playing very well, but you want to give them some cushion. You want to give them everybody a chance to breathe, give a chance for the crowd to be in it. I mean, all of those intangibles are in our favor on Saturday night, but they only work if we give them the opportunity to breathe. So uh, I, I think that's really the game. Make a statement, Duke football, Show people why we're number two, 22 in the country. Show them why we should be better than 22 in the country. Show them that we should be the team in the, in the Coastal Division to fear, not the team that is a pretender. And, and I think this game is a great way to make that statement. Can we go back really quick? Did Jason, what did you say Liberty's nickname was? The Flames. The Flames. Flames. Yep, you got it. Okay, just just double checking because <laughs> I want to make sure that I want to make sure we get the facts right here at Duke Basketball Report. Donald, you're totally right. Duke Duke needs to assert themselves this weekend. We thought a week ago that we were going to be gearing up for this primetime game where Duke was still going to be the underdog against what looked like a very strong Virginia Tech team, and and as you pointed out, things have only gone badly for them in the last week. They lost. They got blown out, honestly, in, in mm-hmm. a game. I, I, th- I think they, they Old Dominion beat the spread by like 40 points or something because they won by two touchdowns. Uh, Virginia Tech loses. Yeah, yeah they were 25-point underdogs. Yeah, they beat the spread by 40 points. That's yeah. crazy. 40 points. Uh, Virgi- and as you pointed out, Donald, Virginia Tech loses two of arguably their most important players. Jackson was was phenomenal for them last year, set a bunch of rec- freshman Virginia Tech records, and we know – from having played in their conference for a while now that Virginia Tech churns out uh, good quarterbacks and, and and good offenses nearly every year. And then, honestly, I think the loss of Trevon Hill might be might be low-key the, the, the biggest loss for Virginia Tech because Duke is is so reliant on the passing game. Not just It's not just Quentin Harris or, or, or hopefully Daniel Jones, but it's neither of them like standing in the pocket producing offense, but their ability to move around, their ability to to run the option, um, not not sort of the 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 triple option Georgia Tech Paul Johnson style offense, but but um, you know getting those reads, doing the what what the people what the kids are calling the RPO now, that is such an important part of Duke's offense, and and Hill was was the main pass rusher. That was the guy that they would rely on to disrupt uh, Duke's offensive game plan. And without him in there, I think it's very important for the Duke offense to do what it does best: keep getting those good quarterback reads, keep um, keep keep making good good decisions with the option. Because Duke has an opportunity here; they are favored. Uh, looking sort of across the board, Duke is favored by about five points in this game against Virginia Tech. That is not that is not a thing that that we see very often. Duke being favored in football against Virginia Tech. This is an opportunity for Duke to uh, to to make a statement about about the program and also to take control of the standings early in the season in the coastal division, because Virginia tech was already looking good with a, with a win against Florida state in their cross divisional game. This is Duke's chance to, to get out ahead of this division and hopefully be in contention for it deep into the season. Miami looks like they, they could figure things out. Um, 
and you know we, we know that the, there's always sort of chaos in our division but it's an opportunity for duke they're under the lights they are playing a team that is now unranked in one poll but but still kind of hovering around the same spot in the rankings where duke now is in in the football rankings let's keep that in mind they've been strong duke's been strong on the road so far this season i want to see them come home against a marquee opponent and and play 60 solid minutes because i think that they are capable of doing it and they guys duke should beat virginia tech this weekend right yeah and and you know what that's that's the great thing is that we're not we're not being you know, facetious when we say, yo, they can win this football game and they should. But I want to make one more quick note before I give it back to you, Jason. One thing that Virginia Tech has done well this season is Beamer ball. Yes, Frank Beamer may have retired, but they are doing so well at special teams. And a lot of the momentum they've had in some of their first two games have been off of special teams. If our special teams can play it cool and win that battle, that is some momentum that Virginia Tech will not have. And that's that's motivation that they're desperately going to want. So if we can hold them off like that and play, you know, you know, good football and and protect the football on punts and field goals and and, and not allow them to get in on the on the uh, kickers, they're going to have a long night because they're going to be frustrated by the fact that they can't play their their form of football. So uh, I, I want to remind folks, you guys did a great job of previewing this game and how important it is. I want to remind everyone, if you go back exactly one year. To September 29th of 2017, Duke's record was 4-0. and Duke was playing a home game against a ranked ACC opponent, a Coastal Division opponent, that everyone thought this was the measuring stick for Duke. And that team was Miami. And, you know, I'm sure people remember the 31-6 to beatdown that we suffered at the hands of the Miami Hurricanes in that game last year. Hey, Jason. Yeah. Why are you why are you bringing up old stuff, man? Like that was a year <laughs> ago. Been, why you, why you, why be, you always got to be so negative, man? <laughs> I'll be honest. I've been thinking about that game for the last two weeks. You've been thinking about it. I, I've definitely been thinking about that game uh, yeah. for uh, for obvious reasons. But yes, uh, Jason, you're absolutely right. That's exactly the game that people call back to when we talk about this weekend. I mean, so we're in the exact same spot uh, again. It's a home game. Again, it's a home game against a team that everyone says this is the measuring stick for the Coastal Division, and uh, you know it's it's huge. If Duke wins this game, uh, I think this game can very much be the uh, the turning point of the season. Not that we need to turn; we're four and zero. We don't want to turn, but I, I really, I, if Duke loses this game, I'm terrified that the team could go downhill again, like we saw last year. Remember last year? We went on a six-game losing streak. I mean, it was horrifying after as well as the season started. This season has started even stronger than last year. Let's be honest. The Duke team that we have seen through the first four weeks of this year is better than the Duke team we saw through the first four weeks of last year. Our ability to bounce back from injury has been truly stunning. We've had some really important players get hurt, and and we're still winning games and winning them really easily. Um, and, and, you know, all the all the computer rankings, all the models, all the all the you know ESPN strength of record, all these other things are saying great great things about this Blue Devil thing, about this Blue Devil team. This Virginia Tech game is time for us to prove all those computer rankings, all you know our national rankings. Time for us to prove that all of that is correct. It's this is one of the most important games, you know, in David Cutcliffe's. Um, you know, in recent years at Duke, not in his entire career, because, you know, this guy has taken us to huge heights. But over the past three years or so, I think this may be, you know, this is arguably one the most important game, I think, that Duke has played in the past several years. At least that's what I'm saying right now. I'll probably say the same thing in another week and then a week after that, you know. But anyway, for the moment, I'm I'm really jazzed for this game. And um, and I really wonder from the standpoint of Virginia Tech, uh, I, I think it'll be interesting to see early on are are they a dejected and defeated team, a team that lost their best offensive and defensive player, a team that just came off, uh, you know, a loss to a team they were supposed to beat by 25 plus points? Are they dejected or or are they resilient? Are they bouncing back? Are they like, no, we are still the bad boys of the coastal division. We are we are still, you know, Frank Beamers. We're still Beamer ball, Virginia Tech, and and we're gonna kill this Duke team. 
you know, uh, it'll be interesting. I think we'll see in the first 10 minutes or so which Virginia Tech there is. Um, and I hope it's the cowering Virginia Tech. I, I hope that, you know, I'd love for us to have another comfortable win. Um, it's good on my heart. So that's what I'm looking for this weekend. This edition of the DBR podcast is brought to you by our good friends, our faithful sponsors, the boys from Bird Campbell. Um, Bird Campbell Law Firm based in Florida and Texas, a pair of former Duke roommates who still are Dukies at heart. We urge you, if you have legal needs, reach out to Bird Campbell. You can find them on the web at birdcampbell.com. That's B-Y-R-D-C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L.com. If nothing else, reach out to them and they'll join you in saying, go to hell, Carolina, go to hell. Gentlemen, it is parting shot time, and Sam, I will let you take the first shot. Well, listen, I've already shared my best story of of the week, so (laughs) y'all already got that. I did want to note that a couple weeks ago, I mentioned that because of the hurricane, the grad student camp out was canceled. Uh, They've actually now uh, reinstituted it for a couple weeks from now, so we are going to have the grad student camp out. I am going to get a chance to uh, sleep out in the blue zone for for two nights for whatever that's worth and uh and get basketball tickets just like just like all of my grad school friends so that's going to be really fun i will have uh i I will have some reporting from from the grad student camp out when when that happens so look forward to that coverage coming in a few weeks very cool donald what do you got for me parting shot wise uh nothing really except for those people who are going to be in the area of Cary um in the next week uh, I will be down there basically for an entire week, uh, which is cool because I will be down there for uh, the United States women's national team. They seek to qualify for the women's world cup. Now, hopefully this goes a lot better than the men's version did last year, but I will be down there. If you guys are in and around Cary and you're going to that game, please find me. Uh, I I'm normally at the tailgates and very, you know, easy to find. So just ask for me, tell them you're with DBR and, and we will, we will break bread and, and, and share a beer together uh, in the name of Duke. Uh, but also, uh, it's great to be. It'll always also be great to be back because hopefully I'll get to run into Sam in the week that I'm there. Um, I, I won't get to see him during uh, this weekend because he'll be at the football game and I will be at the wedding that I mentioned at the top of the show. Uh, but while I am down there, I'm sure Sam and I will have uh, some night where we end up uh, probably not at Shooters, but some bar in Durham uh, having a good beer and having a good laugh. But this leads me to the real thing: is we can get all three of us together. In just under over a month, um, if uh, people fill out that survey uh, that Sam alluded to last week, um, that way we can figure out what kind of space we need for uh, the live show that we're planning in Durham uh, sometime in early November. Yes. Do you remember the URL for folks to reach out to us? I it do. Is- it is tinyurl.com slash Live. I was going to say it, but you you said it anyway. Yes. Oh, my bad. Ti- tinyurl.com slash dbr live folks click on that link put that link in your browser click on it and let us know if you want to come to our special live podcast we'll have a live studio audience so to speak and it's gonna be a lot of fun i cannot stress to the people out there uh for those of you who who have listened and have been diehard loyal fans of the podcast we obviously have love and appreciate you and you already know this uh but for those of you who maybe join us for the first or second time this live uh, podcast that we're planning will be history it will be the first time that all three of us have recorded a podcast together in the same room um we we do this online um since we're in different parts of the country uh and and for me sometimes different parts of the world uh but it will be history making so if you are in durham this will be something that you cannot miss absolutely absolutely i i Donald, I agree. I think it's going to be great. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Yeah, hey, all right. Hey, hey, hey Sam, uh, have you figured all the details, the logistics out? It, that's on you, right, man? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm working on that. <laughs> Good deal. All right, so for my parting shot, I want to head back to football just for a moment because I saw a stat, and I was just like, that's the best stat ever. Folks, when you think of basketball, when I say, hey, top programs in basketball, everyone says the same thing. Duke and Kentucky. And traditionally, when you say worst programs 
worst power five programs in football. Most people say Duke and Kentucky. Um, let's let's just be honest. For for a long, long time, Duke and Kentucky have not been good at football. We've been great at basketball, but not at football. So I was blown away. Best stat of the week. In this week's AP poll, Duke and Kentucky are both ranked. It is the first time that the Duke Blue Devils and the Kentucky Wildcats have been ranked <clears throat> in an AP football poll since September 14th, 1957. <laughs> I want to be clear about something. September 14th, 1957. My parents weren't married yet. They hadn't even met yet. I mean, like, I, Sam, I, I bet, I bet, Sam, I bet your parents may not have even been alive yet. <laughs> Tell me that date one more time. <laughs> September 1957. I, I'm going to go, that's, that's 62 years ago, 61 years yeah. ago. I had, I had one parent. Uh, I had one parent alive. <laughs> Both of mine were born, but barely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're uh, it, unbelievable. First time since 1957, Duke and Kentucky have been ranked in the same AP football poll. By the way, during that span of time, Duke and Kentucky have been ranked in the basketball poll 547 times. <laughs> <laughs> that, I saw that stat. It's incredible. That is crazy. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something. Duke and Kentucky are ranked because they both deserve to be ranked. I saw a couple other really interesting, you know, ESPN does this strength of record thing where they, they look at your strength of record is, you know, not only did you win, but the quality of your opponents and, and how good your opponents are. And then they sort of, you know, they use some crazy formula to figure out what is the strength of your victories. And the number one team in strength of record is LSU and then Notre Dame and then Georgia and then Clemson. And then Kentucky's number five. Kentucky, according to ESPN strength of record, fifth best, then comes Alabama, then Stanford, and then Duke. We're the eighth best team in the country, according to strength of record. And then, you know who comes after us? Ohio State and Oklahoma. Duke's better than Ohio State and Oklahoma. Suck on that for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Some Adam. crazy, crazy heady times, and it's just, it's just so exciting. It's really cool. And last thing I want for my parting shot. I saw a quote from Joe Giles Harris, a great quote after the game. JGH said this. He said, being 4-0 is big. It's exciting. But we signed up for 12 games, not four. I, I love that line. That is, right. that is a guy who has his eye now on I'm the prize. Saturday. Now I'm hype. Let's go. That it, dude has it, he, he knows it. He's got his eye on 12 games, not four. I love it. I'm not going to say I'm not going to say that all eyes are on Durham on Saturday, but all eyes are on Durham on Saturday. And also 12 games, what is this 12 games? I thought we had 15 games to play this year. No, no, no. Actually 14 14 would be pretty cool. 14 to be, you know, that'd be making the ACC championship I would, game. I, 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 I would I would take awesome. I would take 14. I, I I think if you told me we were playing 14 games this year in football, that would be that'd be something else. I'm with that. Be very, very exciting. It'd be really cool. All right, folks, that's going to do it for us here on the DBR podcast. Donald and Sam, thank you so much for joining me. My name is Jason. And folks, remember, if you're out there uh, in the internet land listening to us, please rate us. Please like us on whatever platform it is you're using, whether it's SoundCloud or or Stitcher Radio, or iTunes, or whatever else it may be, rate us, like us. And if you have a question, if you have a comment, if you have a criticism, reach out to us, dbrpodcast at gmail.com. Send us a note. Let us know you're listening. We love to hear from our fans, from our listeners. If you got a comment, we want to hear about it. But that's going to do it this week for podcast number 127, I think it is. Goodness gracious. So many of these. It's really exciting. It's really fun. We will talk to you after next week, after Duke has played Virginia Tech. Go Devils. Beat the Hokies. Duke band. Take us home.